is uh, it's called Golani Spirit. I'll, I'll show you the everybody. So that they, I haven't seen them sell yet in America, but I think they're start. I'm sure they are somewhere, but I think they're they'll probably be start. Yet. It'd probably, be better to order directly from them, huh? Uh, probably. So here's the. I'll just show everybody this this new this new company because I got an email from somebody who's working or helping them, and so this is the this is oh it's fairly expensive. Um, <laughs> well, are they doing? Are they counting the money in in, in their currency or ours? shekels? Yeah, those are shekels, but that's. That's still uh four, the five, currency still like a five but five to one or about four yeah so this is about forty dollars for a gin bottle which is fairly expensive the Iraq is not that much but because nobody ooh, drinks nobody well they do in Israel they do <laughs> in Israel Judith? was that Judith yeah that's Judith yes that's Judith hi Judith Judith hi how are you Judith. I'm all right yep. Well, it's good to see uh, people were, were dragging. They were dragging and they're way in today. It's okay. You're allowed to. You're, it's kind of a little bit, it's a little bit cooler here today. So I think people were. Did you see my wine runner? They were taking their time and that... rolling out of bed. Hi, Dolly. Uh, that, yeah, that's my wine runner. <laughs> and I got a boyfriend too. <laughs> 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 I uh, decard them everywhere. It's just it's hard. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyways, well, I'm glad that everybody made it. It's good to see you, Elizabeth. It's good to check in with you. I'm glad you're glad you're here. We're uh, we got to read the story of of Deborah, and we actually looked a little bit at, at Judith last. Why not? The, the biblical Judith, but we had uh, the the apocryphal the apocryphal Judith, the Judith namesake. Uh, we got to read about these two uh, very cool, actually three very cool women because we read about Yael. But today we're gonna we're gonna turn back we're gonna turn back to to guys and um, and we're gonna read about Gideon or Gidon as he's called in Israel and actually Gidon is a more common Hebrew name, just like the name uh, Ehud. Uh, Jews started naming themselves after uh, the judges, again, in the modern Israel period, when Jews started fighting and started naming themselves after generals instead of just patriarchs. Gold in my ears, I've been brought. Yeah, but from those kinds of people, you start getting, at that time, you start getting people naming like Ehud, like Ehud Barak, and we talked about, uh, there's also Gidon, uh, it, it, we don't say Gideon in Hebrew, it's Gidon, but everyone kind of knows it as, as Gideon. Uh, I think probably there aren't many Jewish Americans named Gideon in the sense that most of us if we're named after a relative, because the name Gideon was not popular uh, amongst Jews for so long, there aren't a lot of uh, diaspora Jews named Gideon, but it is a, uh, he was a biblical hero as we're going to see, we're going to read the couple chapters about Gideon, and um, he actually had another name too, which is kind of interesting, but we're going to be reading about these, these guys and, um, and the cycle of judges that we've been on over the last couple of weeks, reading about this cycle of uh, problems, a judge comes, fixes everything, and then the problems come back, and so it's not a good time in Israel's history. Uh, the story that we're going to read today is a little different than the one we read last week because last week we read about Deborah. We had a we had a story. We had a beautiful song, which is maybe one of the oldest sections of the Bible. So we talked about, uh, and there is a difference in style between the narrative and the poem. Today, there's another issue, which is probably more uh, along the lines of there seems to be several authors at work here because. There seems to be different elements, and there seems, I won't say contradictions, but there's definitely some different voices here that seem to be at play. And it makes, I mean, you, when you when you look at it and you'll see it, you'll see, oh, why did why is that here and not there? And uh, it seems like it, it it's it's one of those places where you go, it seems like there's a few different sources that have been woven together in the story of Gideon. So we're gonna look at this story. Um, it is, uh, 
it is one of the stories of the book of Judges that inspired the modern nation of Israel, which is why, again, why we have Gideons. And so it's one of the, it's one of the places where um, you'll see there, there is part of the mythology and then the kind of the, re, the revisiting of that mythology here. You'll see right away why um, as we read the story. So uh, we're, we're at the, uh, we're at the story of, um, the story of, of Deborah ended in chapter five. Let me just go back to where we're reading from. Um, we read, the last thing we read in chapter five was this text that basically says uh, it's the song of, of Deborah. And then um, in the last part of the line, the last clause or phrase is, and the land was quiet for 40 years, uh, uh, which in Hebrew is Vatishkot Haaretz Arbaim Shana, and the land was quiet for 40 years. So that's the only part of that last chapter chapter five that's not the song and it goes back to narrative literally just to tell us that things were good for 40 years which is a pretty long time i mean it's a generation of peace so deborah is able and and barack her general and yael the heroine of the story they're able to um they're able to deliver israel from the canaanite coalition which was led by uh, the the general the general Sisera and uh, and for um, for a time as we as we uh, as we kind of read the north the northern part of Israel which which Deborah was leading the people of Israel that they are able to find peace and again what's interesting about this is that the, these are um, these are uh, the, the enemies in the story of Deborah are Canaanites. They are the the more the more established city folk of the land, whereas the enemies that we're about to meet were the enemies that we had seen in the story of Ehud. These are Midianite tribes people. These are people coming from the Jordan, the, the Jordan side coming in. So Israel had during the time of Judges people that they were fighting with the Canaanites that were living in the land of Israel, and then they also had to deal with incursions primarily from the Midianites who are seem to be more like Bedouin type people, the Malachites and some of those other people, uh, Moabites, some of these people that live on the other side of the Jordan River but that would cross over. So that's what, that's what we, we see in this story. We go back away from the from the uh, Canaanite forces to these outside people. And so um, where did the Midianites come from? Well, they they came from the Jordan side. There's do there there seems to be some Midianites that live in the land of Israel. Like they that's where their their nomadic arrangement is is to be in that area. Especially this one group we we read about that they call the Kenites, which is where Yael and her husband Heber are from. They're from the they're from the Kenites, which seem to be again a subset of these Midianites, uh, these nomads. But most of the Midianite tribes people live in the Jordan, live in today's, what today is the modern nation of Jordan. So they would cross over into the land of Israel, probably because it was more fertile. There were more farms, as you're going to see. These seem to be more like incursions rather than like pitched battles between the city folk of the Canaanites and the more hill country, more subsistence level farmers that are, that are, that are the Israelites. The Israelites really don't seem to be protected by cities at this point or they seem to be like kind of moving into the cities which probably is fairly reflective of what really did happen which is the israelites at least until the time of of king saul and king david are not really either living in the cities yet or are just not either they don't they choose not to or they're not strong enough to have built these kind of fortifications to have things like walls city walls to have stables and to have uh, places to store chariots and those kinds of things that they later on have during David and, and Solomon's time when they get that kind of strength. So it seems, again, the tribal confederation works, but at the expense of, and this is kind of the theme of judges, that kind of unity and strength and power 
that will come when they're unified under a king and, you know, have a professional army and those kind of things. They can collect taxes. <laughs> collect taxes. They can yeah, they pay they, for all this. They can uh, call up an army and force that to happen, which you'll see here. And again, this is kind of what happened to the United States. I mean, we know when people go back and, you know, like my daughter's studying, she's in 11th grade, Shira, and she's studying the colonial times and the articles of confederation times. And again, you remember that, you know, part of what happened with the United States is that these, these colonies in some cases were very different from each other, had very different cultures, very different mentalities. And, and it was hard for them even to agree to come into a confederation together to fight together, you know, to raise a continental army was not an easy task. It, it took a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, compromises it took you know putting a guy from virginia namely washington in charge of it which some people from the north didn't like and and you know you had to balance it out with having some northern guys like hamilton and some of these other guys also sharing you know in the in the power decisions so these were these were the the country was our country was very much still you know being split up into the different colonies really helped the british because it made it made the it made the it made the united states you know, it took time for the United States to coalesce because these tri these colonies, these tribes had their own agendas, right? And so, you know, splitting people up and, and, and keeping them from, from unifying, it, it helped the, the power structure uh, at the time, which was the British, the British government. So this seems so, to be the case in the story of judges too. I mean, it just makes sense. It just is, it's what's, it's a, the unfortunate thing is we'll see the tribes go, hey, let's fight together. Okay, we'll fight together, but, you know, just this one time, and then we're going to go back and do another thing. And then sometimes, as we're going to see in today's story, no, nah, we're not going to fight with you. We don't care. So so is that is that the mistake the West did when they first mm -hmm. entered the Ottoman Empire and tried to convince all those individual tribes to be one country? Well, it's definitely part of what happened in the Middle East. I mean, the, but the but the problem there was even worse in that you know especially as we saw in Iraq that these tribes and the and these and these different ethnicities Kurds different you know different tribes in in uh, in Iraq they were never they never wanted to be together and and so yeah the British and the French trying to create countries out of out of the remnants of the Ottoman Empire was very hard because there was no there were no nations there to begin with it wasn't like there was an Iraq there I mean Iraq was a complete a complete fabrication and 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 literally made up by by map makers who said well this looks like a good size for a country if we put these blocks together we can make this and this country jordan looks like a country maybe if we can put these tribes together so yeah it was a real mess and 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 partly again is there wasn't a history of there wasn't a national history there so they didn't yeah. want the countries to be strong because they wanted to maintain control of the railroad. Of the oil, the railroad, the oil. All, all of that. Yes. So part of it was was getting people in, in power there that they could trust, which is what they did with the Hussein family. They basically took the the British, at least, took three different, you know, their, their, their three countries that they controlled and basically put, you know, put a Hussein in charge of each one. And the only one that survived, the only the only one of those kingdoms that survived was jordan all the other the all the other uh kingdoms that they that they established they all fell i mean iraq fell you know the 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 stories of what happened in 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 those in those areas um it's not good i mean because again they were artificial so uh yeah i mean the british wanted there to be they wanted those countries to succeed in the sense that, they, that if they were going to be independent they wanted to have control over them but but in reality again they were not they were not real countries and so you know what happens you hope that after i guess 67 years that people have some type of they have some feeling about each other that they don't want to they don't want to uh, descend into a civil war but at the same time you know what is what's in it for them though you know what is what is the like if they don't really have a national identity like how how long do you have to have them have olympic teams together or whatever it is you know so soccer team what like what 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 is it that makes you feel like a nation and so you know and again our whole concept of of nation states really only goes back to the 1800s 17 1800s anyways i mean the whole concept of of a nation 
you know, that that's brought together like that is it's, it's still a fairly new concept in, in human history. So when you think about it from that standpoint, you know, this is still, we're still, and, and by the way, I mean, Zionism was an outgrowth of that idea of there being a nation state for the Jewish people, but, but that's predicated on the idea that you need a nation anyways, like that you have to actually have a nation. Uh, that was a fairly modern idea that Herzl, you know, based Zionism on, but the whole concept of, of, of having a nation is, is not a, it's not a foregone conclusion. Again, who, who knows what will be in the future? I mean, we, we've only, like I said, this is only 200 years, 250 years or so of human history has been this concept of a nation state, which also led to the rise of the United States. I mean, these are all new concepts in human history. So just remember that when we talk about what happens in, in Israel, there's always this kind of like, well, they had a nation. Well, was it really a nation or what was, what was the structure? What was the political structure? If you don't feel like you have to have a nation, what is it that you're actually having? What is actually is it that binds you together? Um, and uh, it's an interesting question. And, and Judaism might have had something to do with this because the whole concept of, of having a covenant, having an agreement that binds people together one could argue some of the bases for that idea are, are actually found in the Torah, which is that you're bound together by a code of law, that you're bound together by a covenant rather than by a king, rather than by like a God or a nationality, which obviously there's some of that in the Torah too. But this concept that you could be bound, bound together by a concept and by a covenant um, it's, it was kind of a different idea if you think about it. So um that's what happens in the book of Judges, and then we see the transition into, when we read the book of Samuel, we'll see that transition, that really painful transition into moving into a monarchy, which again, for most of human, most of human history, monarchies were essentially the, the mode of, of, of political stability, which is, you know, you have a, you have a guy in charge, and then he passes that on to his son, and then his son, and occasionally a daughter pops up. But uh, that was the mode. And we're actually going to see that not today, but next week when we read about Gideon. Um, and really, to some extent, the first attempt at a monarchy in the Bible. A lot of people don't know that they're actually, before there was Saul, there was, there was Avi Melech. Um, we're we're going gonna to take a look at that weird story, uh, not today, but next week. But let's, let's take a look at Gidon and this Interesting that guy. Younger, what? I'm seeing a theme here that younger sons seem to take over, not the older son. You know, oh, like yeah. Jacob and, and David and yes, that is that is the that is the theme of the Bible. The theme of the Bible is that the younger child ends up carrying on uh, the legacy of the family when they're not supposed to. The most the most blatant examples are, are people like Joseph. When it's just no, when it's not even two kids, right? When it's Jacob, when it's uh, Jacob and Esau, that's like, wow, there's only two of them. But then you get into, you get into Joseph, where you got twelve or thirteen kids, or you get into a story of David, where you know there's seven kids, and you know he's the youngest. Then um, you get into Solomon, King Solomon, who's way down the list of of. Uh, we don't, we're not even sure how far down the list he is. Is he fourth? Is he more? It's, it's difficult to even know how far down the list of, of rulers Solomon was when he ends up getting picked. Uh, yeah, that's the theme. The theme is that the kid who's not supposed to be the ruler ends up being the ruler. So that is a different concept, right? Than most. most no, people. it's worldwide, I'd say. It's, it yeah, it, it, no, there, it is. A, there was once upon a time, there was a woodcutter and his wife, and they had three kids and you know the youngest one is going to be the one that succeeds he's the one who right. always right. Saves, the, saves the family but it works because that's not what's supposed i mean it works because that's not what is supposed to happen the law of primogeniture is fairly universal which is that the oldest child gets to inherit more maybe right. so everything this, so this it, is a different idea it, it's it's it always sticks it on its head but it is a as rosemary is saying it's a motif which is but not today, right? It's like, that's what you think, but not here. And so that's what one of the themes of Judaism is. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting about it 
And I actually talked about, I was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at the uh, introduction to Jacob and Esau. The interesting thing about it is one of the reasons why it might've been such a popular theme in Judaism is because Jews saw themselves as a, at the time of the Bible as a fairly new group on the, on the scene, right? The Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Mesopotamians, all of these people, Canaanites maybe even were the old timers. And here we are, the young, the young guys, and, and we're taken over. And so this idea of, of you know, the, the least likely child taken over, and whether it's, you know, whether it's Zeus or whether it's whoever it is, you know, it's, a, it's the one that wasn't supposed to make it ends up, you know, taking over. So some people think that the whole concept of the younger child taking over is really a statement that the Israelites were making about themselves of being, hey, look at us, you know, we're taking over. But that's one theory. I mean, that's one idea that that it is a statement on it what's interesting about it is then as i was talking about this podcast was 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 with evangelical christians that christians then saw themselves and they started kind of retelling our stories their own midrash was that we became the older child so there are christian teachings where the jewish people become esau and christians become jacob and so that then they're the younger son even though there are our sons, they're actually the younger, the younger sibling. And, um, and so the, so then the story gets transferred to them, that, that we're the older brother, and they're the younger brother, and, and that they're taking over, or they're the, they're the ones that God really chose. So it's interesting how the, the stories will be, they'll be recontextualized by people um, to say, oh, yeah, but we're the younger brother now. So, there is that you, you run into that uh, possibility that you, you know, that you have that. And again, I'm not saying every, every Christian believes that, or that's like standard Christian teaching, but it does exist in the early church fathers where they would refer to themselves as the younger child. And, uh, and I've even seen the Pope refer to Christians as different popes, I think, including this current Pope uh, who has said that Jews are our older brothers. Now, that's wonderful to say that we're brothers, but there's also a, a little jab there, which is the older brother doesn't get the inheritance, right? The other brother, the older brother isn't the one that gets to be the one that God chooses. So there is, you have to be careful when you see that to know, yeah, maybe it's not a complete, it's not completely a, 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 it's not maybe always praise. So just keep that in mind that sometimes now we're conceived, now we're seen as the older brother, though you could also say we're a parent, a mother or a father of Christianity would maybe be more, maybe be more appropriate, but uh, there you have it. But um, so let's take a look, Rosemary, if you'd like to start, we're in chapter six okay, and uh, we get to well the cycle, the cycle continues. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of Midian, the children of Israel made for themselves the tunnels which are in the mountains, and caves, and strongholds. So you can see there's a 40-year peace followed by seven years of uh, of being subservient, or at least in a weird way, we're frightened and living in fear from the Midianites. So again, the Midianites would come over from the other side of the Jordan, and they would come against us, and they were beating us in battle. And it's interesting because here it says that we made tunnels. So we hid out from these guys. So they would come over, they'd do their raids, and we would hide in tunnels and in mountains and caves. So this is a little... Um, I don't know, reminiscent of peoples who feel that their uh, only way of surviving is by hiding. I guess it's a little reminiscent of some of the things we saw in Vietnam 50 years ago, where we had whole tunnel cities underneath where people were hiding out. Um, not a good situation, not one that we would want anybody to live with this kind of fear. So... Here's what happens. And so it was when Israel had sown that Midian and Amalek and the children of the east came up against them. 
and they encamped against them and destroyed the produce of the earth as far as Azah and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came like locusts for multitude for both they and their camels were without number right. and they entered the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of Midian and the children of Israel cried to the Lord. Well, you yep. get up early tomorrow, you can do some, some of your... We got you, Francine, I think you're on. Anyways, uh, what happens is, is that the, there's raiding parties. I mean, you can see it. And it actually specifically says that they come in with their camels which again indicates that these are we're in that period of time where camels have been domesticated and they're being used for warfare too. They're being used for raids. Uh, and we, we can't, uh, we have no way of fighting against these people. They're outnumbering us. And again, it says all of Israel from, from the border of the Jordan River all the way to Gaza, all the way to the Mediterranean are being raided by these guys. And it says that Israel, that Israel was greatly impoverished. So it's not like these people are taking away their military might or putting them in army or making them slaves. They're taking away all their produce. They're taking away all their animals. They're taking their grain. They're taking all of the stuff that they you know that they're living off of and it is um it's not like being taxed or being you know being governed you know unfairly these are people that are just coming in and raiding whenever they want and taking anything that they want and so israel is um is crying out as they do they're crying out to god And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried to the Lord because of Midian, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slaves, and I delivered you out of the land, hand of Egypt and out of the hand of all those that oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you did not obey my voice. So a prophet comes and tells the Israelites, I took you out of the land of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. I brought you here. I gave you this land. You fear the gods of the Amorites, which are the Canaanite peoples. Uh, and you didn't obey. Um, you feared their gods. You didn't obey my voice, as we're going to see specifically what that means. But it seems like it's fairly clear you're worshiping their gods and you're not paying attention to me. Problem is here, of course, as you notice, it doesn't say who the prophet is. It's not a prophet of God, Navi. It doesn't say who it is. The rabbis don't like that. They don't like the fact that there's an unnamed prophet that's mentioned here. So uh, one of the more common um one of the more common people that is or the common appellation for this person is that it's actually uh the priest uh pinchas elazar's son aaron's grandson why because he probably would have still been living or he might have still been living around this time he's one of the only people in the bible that we know about that was a good righteous dedicated person to god uh and he could still have been alive we don't know who it is. It doesn't say. It doesn't say later. It doesn't say in another source. That's the Midrash, because the Midrash doesn't like us not knowing who that prophet was. But it doesn't say. Now, that's one thing that should have given people a little bit of hope, a little bit of warning. Well, let's see what happens. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under the terebinth, which was in Ophrah that belonged to Yoash Yo of Itzeri, and his son Gideon was threshing wheat by the winepress to hide it from Midian. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Yep. 
and that is called Gibor Chayil, a man of strength of Chayil, like we say Eshet Chayil, a woman of valor, a man, a mighty man, a hero of valor. Now, we don't know why he's a mighty man of valor. It doesn't say. All it tells us is that his father's name is Yoash, and uh, he's threshing wheat. And he's not only threshing wheat, but he's hiding the wheat from Midian. So he's, he's trying to at least keep their produce, the family's produce, away from the Midianites so that they can't get it. They can't come and raid it. Uh, whatever it was, whatever uh, God saw in Gideon, this angel is the one who comes to him and tells him, uh, God is with you. And now we're going to see what this call is. So this is, this is specifically an angel. It says that right away. It doesn't say God. It says an angel of God, a messenger of God. Um, the question of whether he's supernatural at this point, you don't know, but we're going to see that it's a supernatural entity. Um, he comes to him under the terebinth, which is a, a fancy way of saying the oak, the oak grove. Uh, we read about terebinths, especially back in Genesis. We read about some of the places that uh, Abraham lives. He, he'll set up his tents in the terebinths, the alone Mamre, the terebinths or the oaks of Mamre. It's an oak. It's an oak grove, which we have a lot of in Santa Clarita, by the way, in this part of California. We have oak groves, little grove, um, and. Uh, this is where he is, which seems a little bit more out in the open, but again, maybe he was hiding it. There's a cave or a tunnel nearby that he's hiding it, but he seems to right now, all we know is that God has chosen him. We read that there's a prophet telling people to do the right thing and not to give up. And now we have an angel actually coming to do this. So it seems like there's maybe like, again, this is one of the first or earlier parts of maybe where we start to see that there's two hands at work here. One where we have a, an angel and one where we have a prophet. Not that they're doing different, you know, that they have to, they couldn't both be working, but you know, maybe there was a tradition that there was a prophet giving people hope. And here you have an angel appearing to a guy. Let's read what happens. What does he tell him? And Gideon said to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this befallen us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this thy might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? So what's so cool about this, of course, is that the angel comes to Gidon. And he speaks to the angel as if he's God. He doesn't say, hey, angel. He says, God. Uh, and uh, um, um, he says what a normal person would say when an angel comes to him and says, hey, uh, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, I'm with you. Where the you normal been? reaction is, where have you been? <laughs> Right. What have you what have you been doing for the last seven years? If you're if you're the God who does all these miracles for us, why are you why did you stop? Why? Why have you forsaken us? So this is a really powerful scene of a person asking the normal question to God, which is, yeah, why now? What, what, why me? Why, why are you doing this now? And so. Um, Gidon has a, a not only a very human reaction, but it's very reminiscent of actually the Torah portion that we read last week, where God first appears to Jacob, our ancestor, the ancestor of Gidon, and essentially every Israelite that would ever exist, which is that Jacob's like, wow, I, I didn't realize that God was really here until I had my dream. And then, of course, what does Jacob do? He makes a bargain with God. He says, God, if you protect me and help me return and bless me in my journeys, then I will make you my God, and I will give you a tenth of everything that I have, give you a tithe. Um, it was very conditional on God delivering. Uh, you're going to see that same attitude 
if you will, from, from Guidon, from his descendant. That Guidon also seems to, um, it's, not, it's not that he's not sure, uh, he wants some proof, which I think, again, is a very human reaction to God coming to you and saying, I've chosen you. And so let's look, <laughs> it's, not, it's not one thing, actually, it's several things that he's going to ask for God uh, for proof. So uh, very, very human, if you will. Okay, here's what he says. And he said to him, oh, my Lord, with what shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is the poorest in Menashe, and I am the youngest in my father's house. Wait, so here again is this, I'm the youngest, right? I'm, not, I'm the least likely to succeed. Our family is the least likely to succeed. And here, right here, we, le we learn that he's from the tribe of Menashe. So he's from the Manassites. He's from Joseph's family. Ephraim and Manasseh are both the sons of, of Joseph. And they're fairly powerful uh, tribes in the sense that they're in the heartland of Israel. They have pretty good numbers. They, remember, Manasseh is split into two. There's a Manasseh on the west side in modern Israel, and then there's a Manasseh that's part of the tribes that live on the other side of the Jordan, modern-day Jordan, or in the, definitely in the area of Golan, of the Golan Heights. So this is a powerful tribe, but, you know, at the time, not very rich. They're, they're, uh, they are, um, he doesn't see what is so special about him. And so here's, here's, here's the negotiation, if you will. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall smite Midian as one man. And he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Yep. Depart, depart not from here, I pray you, until I come to you and bring forth my present and set it before you. And he said, I will remain until you come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out to him under the terebinth and presented it. Yep. So he, he makes a sacrifice. A little meat, a little matzah, a little soup. It's not matzah ball soup, but it's definitely matzah cakes and meat and, uh, and a little broth in a pot. Uh, maybe I guess he can make his it could, own. It could be matzo ball soup. Make his own matzo ball soup. It's deconstructed matzo ball soup. Right. It's a very popular thing to do nowadays. Deconstructed. It's deconstructed matzo ball soup he gives them. So this is for the angel of God. But, you know, speaking on behalf of God, let's see what God does with his offering. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord stretched out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and the fire rose up out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Yep. Now, normally, that's a pretty good sign. I got God took my offering. I made an offering. God took it, made fire come out. Oh, my gosh. This must be an angel of the Lord. And it came out on a rock that I poured broth on. I made it harder because I made it wet. See that again in the Elijah story when you pour water on something and then it still catches fire. That's a real sign, right? It's not a, it's not like I, you know, it's not like you, I made it harder for God. This so, is Gandalf, you know, with the staff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Gandalf. So he makes, he makes this, he makes this offering mm -hmm. blow up. It's not just, it doesn't just, Maybe it wasn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It was. It was Gandalf. It was not. Uh, it was not. Uh, it didn't evaporate. It didn't. It actually blew up. It's on fire. So that's pretty good. Like at that point, most of us would go, "Oh yeah, that's God. That's God at work here." Uh, Gideon does not, at least at this point, seem utter, wholly convinced. So let's take a look at what, <laughs> what happens. Well, let's and walk. When Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, because I have surely seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, Peace be to you, fear not, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it Adonai Shalom. To this day, it is yet in Ophrah, 
of the Aviazri. Right. And so the Aviazri are the group of Manassites that live there. Uh, it's a place called, uh, the city now is called Ofra. And uh, Adonai, uh, Avi Ezri means uh, my father is my helper. My father is the helper, which again could refer to your father, but also could refer to God. And uh, he makes an altar there. And the altar, according to tradition, is still there. And God says to him, Shalom Lecha, you'll have peace, peace, you know, peace. Don't, don't be afraid. al tira. And you will not die. I mean, that's three three good things. You'll have peace. You don't be afraid. You won't die. Um, and so everything seems good. Like everything looks like Gidon is ready to go. Um, that's why the next part seems a little strange. Well, not the next part, but some of this part will uh, uh, is kind of step back a little bit. So here we go. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, take your father's young bullock and the second bullock of seven years old and throw down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is, beside, that is by it and build an altar to the Lord your God upon the top of this strong point on the level place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the Asherah which you shall cut down. Right. So uh, what the commandment here is to, <laughs> is to cut down the altars to Baal and to Baal's wife, this Asherah, this female consort of God that they were worshiping. And his job is to cut them down, uh, throw down the altar, take down the altar, and then take the Asherah, which seems to be built, seems to be made out of wood, right? The Asherah seems to be made out of wood and was either a fertility totem pole, kind of like a stick in the ground that people would worship as a fertility sign or do sacrifices on it, um, a holy tree, they would call it sometimes. Um, this was a way of worshiping Baal. And so not only do you cut that down, you actually take that and you use the wood as part of the sacrifice. You actually burn it down and use it for your offering to God. So you're going to pull down the Baal and Asherah altars, and you're going to make an altar to God at that same place. Now, first of all, it says this is the altar that your father, this is your father's altar, which means that his father, Gideon's father, is has an altar. So whatever his father does, you know, father is assumedly a man of, of uh, renown and, and importance in, in, in the tribe. He's got his own Baal statue and his own Baal sh shrine or altar with the Asherah in his, in his, on his property. It doesn't quite fit with we're the poorest family. Correct. But it's also telling you that this was so common that... Mm -hmm. Every Jew who had, you know, every Israelite, every uh, ancient Israelite had his, you know, or at least the tribe, you know, lead tribal leaders had, and again, he could have been a poor tribal leader, but he could have still been a, a, a leader, his, his father. What was going on here was widespread worship of Baal. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's said in such well, a way. That the evil in the sight of the Lord that they were doing, right? Yeah. And it doesn't seem here to be like, that seems to be the norm. It seems to be like, that's what they were doing. They were didn't, worshiping these gods. Didn't, didn't families have their own to Yahweh too? I don't, we don't know. I mean, we, we don't know that he, they had one. That's the interesting thing is that we don't know that they had an altar to God. That they had their, own, that, that what were people worshiping God or were they worshiping Baal and Asherah? I mean, the, the point is, is that it says that there was 40 years of peace. So we, we have an archaeologist who's found our, you know, with the four horns on the corner. Isn't that what our, our, our um, altars look like? They have yeah, horns? Yeah, but their altars look like that, too. Oh. That's the problem. The carnot, the horns on the altar were a common motif. So it's not like we can be sure of, 
of what is what you know what's an altar what was an altar for Baal and what was an altar for for God look wow. it didn't have to have those horns anyways it could have been simply an altar some of them did definitely some of them did but there also could be that that again there were altars that were simply you know piles of rocks that were more importantly put in a high place a place of distinction, a place on the top of a hill where people would see it and they would say, oh, that's where our local altar is. That's where our local place is where we offer up offerings. And it could be, again, that, you know, it was like a barbecue, essentially, that anybody could use. And, and you know, later on, there might have been priests or Levites that were only the ones allowed to do it. But and then later on, they weren't allowed to even use those. I mean, you know, there's a real sense that that in the Bible that part of the reason why we went to Jerusalem having only one place is because whenever you have a bunch of altars that are all scattered around, people do whatever they want on them. Sometimes that's an altar for Baal. Sometimes it's an altar for God. Whatever it is, you know, once it's out in the country, anyone can use it and they can repurpose it. So he just definitely repurposed it. Gidon just repurposed it. For God. What? It's really interesting. This is really interesting to me because the articles I've read, it's always like they found this four-cornered altar, and it has to be to, to Yahweh. You know that that I didn't realize it could also be Canaanite or you know a lot of times when they write these things like a biblical arch, they're so sure you know about their their thesis. Nope, but people, but that's not yeah, that's not a, that. I'm just telling you that is a normal a normal situation to have those to have those corners. And what was interesting is that uh, when they built the you know when the when the temple was built for everybody you know the one in jerusalem it didn't it didn't end the pro, the process of of worshiping in your local altar it was not it wasn't like everybody just tore down their altars and say oh we're all going to worship in jerusalem now we know that the israelites were still especially in the north wanting to use their own altars they they were like who are you to tell us we have to worship in Jerusalem? We've been worshiping here for hundreds of years on our local altar. You can't tell us not to, to go there. So this happens, you know, again, that was really what, what made the North separate was when they had their own two altars, one in Dan and, and one in, one in uh, Bethel, where, where um, Jeroboam established these two altars, these national altars for there. And again, did everyone in the north want to worship in Dan and Dan and Bethel? Maybe they also worshipped in, you know, in, in at this place where where uh, Gidon, uh, you know, made his altar. It probably was, again, not an easy thing to get anyone to agree to say, "Oh, we're only going to worship in this one place." And um, my guess is is that that was always a it was always there was always tension between getting people to worship where they wanted them to uh you know look today we have a different take on it which is that whether if people worship in a synagogue or they worship in their backyard you know we're just happy that people are finding a spiritual connection wherever they are but we still want people to use the synagogue as a focal point right we still try to figure out ways to bring people to our to have a a, a reason to come together and and in, and in some ways it's harder today than it was for our ancestors because the religious component isn't there from the standpoint of I, I couldn't in good conscience tell somebody, hey, the only place that you can pray is in our synagogue. I mean, that that would be ridiculous. Now, it may be the only place that you can read Torah or one of the few places that you can read Torah. Uh, it's one of the few places where you'll hear a musician sing, you know, sing, you know, singing beautiful melodies. But it's not the only place you can worship. That's for sure that we can never assert. When you tell people the only place they can offer a sacrifice is that place or only in that place or only in Jerusalem, then you're really telling people we're restricting you're we're restricting where you can where you can pray, where you can be close to God, if you will. So uh, there was probably always that religious tension um, in Israel. And, and again, I mean, I would guess throughout human history that, that the, the, those the control of religion and politics was always, was always, they always went hand in hand, you know, that this was, this was the way people asserted their political authority. So, Gidon is commanded to do this, and we're going to read what he did, what he did with this, this Baal altar, Mizbeach. Yep. Then Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. And since he feared his father's household and the men of the city, 
he could not do it by day, but he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was pulled down and the Asherah that was by it was cut down and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. So he did it at night. And it says specifically did it at night because he didn't want to upset his father and his father's, his brothers, assumedly, the rest of his family. And he didn't want to upset the people of the city. These were Israelites. These were Manassites. These were people that were shouldn't have been doing this in the first place. But yet, that's what they were doing. Did not say they were doing it because the Canaanites told them to do it. The Midianites definitely went to told them to do it because we don't even know the Midianites worshipped the same Baal that they had in Asherah. We don't even know. They just did it because they wanted to. And he had to worry about his own family punishing him. Again, however much he's saying his father, his, his family's poor, whatever, they still have at least 10. They have at least 10 because he took from those people 10. That's the Hebrew. He took from them 10 men. So assumedly there were more than 10 men. He took 10 of them. And he essentially took some of the staff, not his family. It says he took the staff. It could be servants. It could be slaves. It could be hired people. We don't know that they're slaves, but the word Eved could be a servant, a slave, which is why it's translated as servant. It could be either one. And that's who did it with him. So he didn't do it by himself, but he did it at night and he did it. Um, and he did it with a limited group of people. And that is going to be an important theme for the story of Gidon. And they said one to another, who has done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Yoash, has done this thing. And then the men of the city said to Yoash, bring out your son that he may die because he has pulled down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the Asherah that was beside it. Yeah, so his punishment is death. He did something horribly wrong and he's going to be punished by the people of the city. And they tell the, his dad, bring him out. We're going to kill him. That's what he's going to do. It's what's going to happen to this guy. This guy did it. We know he did it. We're going to kill him. So what does Yoash do? And Yoash said to all that stood against him, Will you plead on behalf of Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death before morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself that his altar has been pulled down. Therefore, on that day, he called him Yerubal, saying, let Baal plead against him because he has pulled down his altar. Yep. So his dad defends him. Yoash, his father, defends him. And according to this, he says, look, if, if Baal is so strong, let him plead for himself. Let, let, let him defend himself. What, what did my son do? He pulled down an altar to Baal, by the way. So his father defends him. But what's interesting is, is that his father, it says, names him Yerubal. Now, the name Yerubal clearly has the name Baal in here. Where does the word Yerubal mean? It means literally to praise Baal or to strive for Baal. This meaning of this means that let Baal plead against him, let Baal come against him, seems to be a little bit of a stretch. So what's interesting about this story is that Gidon seems to have another name. His other name is Yerubal, Jerubal or Yerubal in Hebrew. Jerubal is what he's known as in the translation, right? It's, it's with a J, but Jerubal. He's the same guy. Gidon has another name. The problem is his other name has Baal in it. And it seems to be like, let Baal be fought for or, or, or you know, raised up. But the flip on this is that his name, according to his father, is going to be let Baal strive for it. Now, it's a little bit of a problem because it doesn't really explain how he got this name, uh, which doesn't seem to be a condemnation of Baal, but, but rather a magnification of Baal. Um, 
So, um, there seems to either be another author at play here who's bringing in a story of how Baal of Yerubal got his name, um, or there's an attempt here at retelling the story of how he got the name and that it's not a bad reason why he was named. He was actually, this is a good reason why he was named this. The problem is, is we have another place in the coming up in the book of Samuel where we learn, uh, where we not learn, we're, we're told about or we're reminded of Jerubal as a hero. And in that place, he's not called Jerubal or Gidon. He's called Yeruboshet. Now, Boshet means shame. That's what the word means. Shame, Boshet. And it's used a couple of places in the Bible, especially in Samuel, where people didn't want to use the name Baal in the name. The most famous being one of uh, Saul's own sons, Mephi Boshet, who is called uh, Mef Mephi Baal, but he's renamed Mephi Boshet in the book of Samuel when his name seemed to have been Mephi Baal. So we know that occasionally, or not occasionally, but at least in the book of Samuel, the author of that book did not want to use the name Baal for any Jewish person. And so whenever he came across the name Baal in a name that should have been a, a good name a, for a good person, he changes the name to Boshet. So Yerubal seems to, or Gidon seems to have this name that at least later on people did not want to even use the name Baal. It doesn't prove that this is written by a different author, but it also seems to be that other people did not feel comfortable with his name Yerubal. That's all I want to tell you, because we know that that guy that they referred to in Samuel is the same guy as Yerubal slash Gidon. So we know he has those two names. We don't usually call him Yerubal. He's called Gidon, uh, but it says he has another name. And uh, this is a reason maybe why he's called Yerubal. Seems to be a little bit of a stretch, but it's okay. The bottom line is, it shows you how pervasive the worship of Baal is that a kid could be named Baal. And some of our king's own sons use the name Baal in their son's names. So that is Jerubal, which is one of Gidon's names. Then all, all right. Midian and Amalek and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he blew a shofar and Aviasri mustered behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh who also mustered behind him. And, and he sent messengers to Asher and to Zebulon and to Naphtali and they came up to meet them. Yeah, so they're gonna get everybody together and it looks like, again, they're going to battle to fight back finally against the Midianites and the Amalekites. And again, the Amalekites are the same group that seem to be sometimes with the Midianites. They seem to be fighting there. Sometimes they fight by themselves, but they're a subgroup. And we know that Amalek is like our eternal enemy because they are always going to be attacking us and we always have to try to destroy them. The Amalekites are also seem to be like Bedouin raiders. Whenever we see them, they're, they're never in a city. They're, they are like raiding parties. We do know that they have kings, at least later on, that they have a king, which seems to imply that they have some type of political organization where they would have had a king, um, which again is not usual for just tribes people. Usually people who are uh, tribe nomadic tribes people usually don't have kings. They'll have like a tribal elder or a tribal leader that they kind of recognize, but very rarely will they call him a king. But they do later on uh, during the time of Saul have king. Um, but uh, here we see Kidon blowing a shofar. And what is it? It's a battle cry. Very clear that this is a shofar being blown into blown for the purpose of going to war. I only think about that because for those who saw the last episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, that is part of the 
um, storyline in the last episode. That's all I'll say. I'm not going to ruin it in case you're going to watch it, but there was a shofar being blown in that episode uh, a couple of times. And definitely for the cult, for going into battle, if you will, or to alert people, I would say. So um, that's all I'm going to say. So it's the fourth episode. So blowing a shofar here is clearly part of the campaign, as we saw with the story of, of uh, Jericho. It's part of um, it's part of war. We don't we remind people of that sometimes at Rosh Hashanah, but it's a call to battle sometimes. The sound of the shofar. All right, so sounds pretty good. Sounds like we're we're ready to go. And Gideon said to God, "If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor." And if there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground elsewhere, then shall I know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow and pressed the fleece together and wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Wow. Okay, so I need another miracle. I need a little bit more proof. So what I said before, and I kind of like... Let you know that there was more stuff coming where God was going to be put on the uh, put on put to the test. This is a weird one for miracles that God does. This definitely doesn't rank really really high as a miracle, but this is what He says. You know, putting a fleece down on the ground, wool fleece. If it's wet but dry everywhere else, then I know that you're God. Now again. He said before to God, let you know, burn up my sacrifice. You thought at that point he was he had the proof. Nope. Didn't have enough proof. So you're going to say, okay, well, that's a fairly human response. I want to make sure God is still with me. Like God said that to me a few weeks ago. Is God still here with me? Is God still, you know, am I still doing the right thing? Is you know, so you get it. Okay, fine. I still need to see God. You know, I need I need a little bit more proof. These I mean, have a deal of magic tricks, don't they? <laughs> well, anyway, it gets even worse from what he does next. <laughs> and Gideon said to God, "Let not your anger burn against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray you, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece." And upon all the ground, let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry on the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Yeah. So now he says, God, if you're really there, just reverse the trick, right? So, I mean, this is one of the strangest things, because first of all, again, in the scheme of miracles, this is kind of small, but he makes it a little bit trickier and a little bit more amazing by reversing it the next night. So, okay, maybe that was, that was a fluke. And now I got to see the opposite. Now, if I can see the opposite, then I really know. So here, what you have is not one, not two, but three proofs that God is there. Now, I will tell you that this does seem a little audacious. On the face of it, it seems pretty seems pretty um, pretty nudgy, if you will. Now, I will tell you that I do believe that these last two tr trials of God, I think are from the same author and it's the same it's the same name for God. It says it says Elohim talks to God, Elo the Elohim name for God. Uh, and he, he's you know he's kind of he's kind of um, really making sure with two with two tests. But I believe that that's one Gidon story. The other Gidon story, the story of the of the offering is uh, a Mizbeach La Adonai to the Yudhe Vavhe name. So if that story is separate, you really have two stories of, of Gidon trying God, one with the sacrifice and one with the with the fleece. I will tell you I like the idea of authorship on this being uh two different uh, versions of the story, one with the burnt offering and then here with the fleece, namely because otherwise Gidon looks like a real pain in the neck. And I really think he's a little too nudgy. Uh, if we have one story where he's already convinced after seeing the, the offering, he's good to go. 
which he does seem good to go, by the way. I do, I do want to put out there. He seems good to go already, okay? He seems like that's why he now can call everybody into battle because he had the offering. He's got guts. He's pulled down the altar, first step, pulling down the altar. Going to test out the waters, make sure everybody's on my side. Uh, we're going to have a little showdown. And then I'm going to now, – now there's another version where he already has kind of done some of this stuff, and now and now he – but he hasn't yet done an offering. And so now he does this thing with the fleece. So I kind of like the two different versions of this story rather than this was written by one person who seems to have Guidon not really get what's going on, but that's my take on it. And again, I don't usually show that. In this case, I think it actually makes a little bit more sense and makes Guidon look a little bit more uh, faithful than, than the other way, which is really, you need three. Um, and th and this, it's, therefore, there's one in one version and then the two, the fleece thing in this one. So I, I, that's where I kind of I, I kind of lean to on this, which is that Guido now, one way or the other, one version or the other is now ready to go into battle. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a if that was a weather issue, you know, somehow there was some kind of weather pattern that only allowed for fleece to get wet. Now. Not anymore because I just I just made God make it the reverse, so it's got to be. So this is the story of how Gidon has his faith uh, proven, if you will. Which again, very much like Jacob, you know, I need to I need to see some miracles. I need to see you need to deliver God. You need to give me some stuff. So uh, this is Gidon's proof, if you will. Um, any questions or comments before we read now the battle, the great battle? Um, nothing? Okay. So let's take a look at the story now of what happens in the battle when he when he calls. Oh, I was going to tell you, this. The, there, there's, a, there's a feeling to this story to me, at least, as someone who loves movies and especially like, you know, really good Western movies. This really does seem like the guy from the, the Mexican village, I don't say Mexican village, but, you know, it's usually like, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the, the group of bandits it's raiding the town, the village. And again, in this case, it's not the white guy from across the border or whatever that's defending them. It's not the three amigos version. Uh, this is, this is the local guy, the local kid who decides to defend his village from the banditos. And he, and he, um, you know, he, he's, that's what he's going to do. These guys come in, they steal all the stuff, and then they leave, and they kill some people, they shoot up the town, and then they leave. That's what the feeling I get in the story, which is, this is the story of a young, courageous guy who's going to defend his people, who are, you know, they, they don't have the resources, but they're going to band together, and they're going to fight back this very scary uh, raiding party. They're not, again, they're not another government, they're not a, they're not a, uh, they're not the they're not another nation necessarily. They're just a group of people that can come in anytime they want and steal everything and then go. That's kind of the feeling that I have when I read this story. But then again, I love those Western movies. And um, when the town decides to finally fight back. All right, so here it is. This is, the, this is them fighting back. It's a great story. And this is the Jewish twist on it. And I will tell you that it's more of the myth of modern Israel than anything else. Um, which uh, I think you'll see in the story. Okay, here we go. Then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and camped beside Enharod so that the host of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people that are with you are too many for me to give Midian into, your, into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 22,000 and 10,000 remained. So did everybody just see what God just did? Yeah, he's told half the army to go home. He says, I don't need the whole army. Go home. If I, you don't need the, If you do this with your army, you'll think you did it by yourself. Exactly. <laughs> I need you know, I need you people to know that I did it and not you did it. If there's too many people fighting, 
then you're all going to say you did it. You didn't do it with God. He just had a really good army. We had a lot of people. We we beat back the Midianites. Uh Uh-uh. Send them back. Get rid of these people. Right? And he said to them, whoever's afraid, who's ever fearful, which you're, by the way, supposed to do as a Jewish general, right? The Torah tells us you're supposed to do that anyways. You're supposed to send back anybody who who planted a vineyard who hasn't hasn't uh, reaped it yet. They, anybody who's had a house that they haven't finished dedicating, anybody who just got married, you're supposed to send all those people. And then you're supposed to send back anybody who hasn't, uh, who d- doesn't have the courage, who doesn't have the strength to do it, send them back. So this is just what happened. They just sent back half the army. But wait, there's more. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down to the water and I will sift them for you there and it shall be that of whom i shall say to you this shall go with you that one shall go with you and of whoever i say to you this shall not go with you that one shall not go yep so we're going to go down to the river and i am going to i'm going to choose these people we're going to choose our we're going to do our own draft so he brought the people down to the water and the lord said to gideon Everyone that laps of the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, him shall you set by himself. Likewise, everyone that bows down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouths, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird um, scene. And a lot of people have talked about this. There are biblical commentaries on this, especially Christian commentaries on this. People love this image of people getting down on their knees to to um, to drink versus uh, someone who got down and kind of lapped up the water. Um, more like an animal. I mean, that's what it says. Like the dog laps up water. Uh um but it's more like it's more like you bent down and you put your hand in the water and brought up to your mouth but everybody else just got down on their knees and yeah so it, it's kind of weird <laughs> because I would, think that, I would think the one that that went down on their knees would look more like a dog drinking well no they're talking about somebody who went down on their knees like picked up a cup or something as opposed to lying down almost and did just bringing the water to their mouth like this or lapping it up, mm-hmm. right? So these are people that are not afraid to get dirty, so to speak. And, and that's usually the assumption here was that these were the, the, the more uncouth of the group, the ones that were a little bit more, um, maybe the less distinguished people, you know, the, the, the people who, if you looked at them at a restaurant, did not seem to know how to use a fork and knife. And so this was the, this seems to be the assumption is that these are people who are a little rougher around the edges. Um, Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I think people kind of work this around whatever point that they're trying to teach from it. The the Bible seems to basically be saying, it's just less people. I mean, the if, remember, if ten thousand if ten thousand people go down and only three hundred are doing that, that's your answer. Those are the people who are really not like everybody else. And we get a really small group. We get a real small sampling size. So it seems to be more like, how do we get our small sampling size? But people oftentimes say, well, it's not just that. It says something about the people that were chosen. You know that again, these are the people that are a little bit a little rougher around the edges. Uh, they're, they're a little sloppier. Uh, they're, they're not dis, they're not dignified. Uh, all of these things, you know, again, you'll hear people comment about this, this scene. Um, I, you know, it's difficult to draw out too many conclusions from the way these people drank water, other than the fact is that usually when people behave like dogs, In the Bible, that's not seen as a good thing. We've talked about this before. Dogs are not seen as, they're not seen in the same way that we see them today, which is as our best friends. These, uh, at the time, dogs were still somewhat undomesticated, or again, if they were domesticated, they were taking care of sheep and they were, um, they were still pretty rough. They were not poodle dogs and they were not, 
purse dogs. They didn't go in your handbag, whatever. They, these were not those kind of dogs. So these were, um, these were not like my little golden doodle. These are, these are, these are dogs. They're village that, dogs are living on the garbage. Yeah, they eat garbage. The Talmud says anything that a dog eats isn't food anymore. So if a dog eats these kinds of things, don't worry about it. It's not food. You don't even have to consider it food. You have to worry of it, whether it's kosher or not. By the time a dog eats it, it's garbage. So it, that's really what the status of it is. If a dog if a dog eats it, it isn't food anymore. So yeah, this is this is not usually a good thing to be lapping water or behaving like a dog in any in any way. So these dogs do their thing, uh, and people who behave like dogs are doing their thing. Take away what it is, what you what you have. It's 300 people. This is it. Everybody else, go home. And the Lord said to Gideon, by 300 men that lapped will I save you and deliver Midian into your hand and let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took provisions in their hands and their shofar and their shofars, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. Yeah, so they're going to war with 300 guys. Uh, they have provisions. And once again, they have shofars. That seems to be pretty important. Grab that shofar. You can grab your gear and your, your you know, the rest of your stuff. But take a shofar with you. This is going to be critical for the battle. Because they have a shofar. I'm going to show you a map in a second what we're looking at. And it was on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down to the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you fear to go down, go with Pura, your boy, down to the camp, and you shall hear what they say. And afterwards shall your hands be strengthened to go down to the host. Then he went down with Pura, his boy, to the fringe of the armed camp, the armed men that were in the camp. And Midian, now Midian and Amalek and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like locusts for multitude, and their camels were also were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. Yeah, so this is a big army that they're facing, and it looks like a locust, looks like a whole, it's a disaster waiting to happen. The camels are there, there's, it looks like I mean, vastly outnumbered, and and again, Gideon, Gideon, and his and his man, his ward, his assistant, his page, are looking at over the uh, armies. They're kind of scouting it out, and one would say that after seeing this, they're probably a little scared, based on what they're seeing right now. This is kind of a frightening thing to see, and God has said, "I'm going to deliver them to your hand." And they're probably thinking to themselves, really, how? How, God? What are you going to do? And this is what we get. And when Gideon had come, behold, there was a man that told a dream to his fellow and said, behold, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a slice of barley bread was rolling through the camp of Midian, and it came to a tent and smote it so that it fell and overturned it so that the tent tumbled down. And his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Yoash, a man of Israel, for into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the camp. So there's he overhears this tale or this dream, the story that is going to give him a whole lot of courage, which is a weird story. It's a dream. It's clearly symbolic that uh, a a, a, a loaf of bread or slice of bread. I'm not really sure if it has to be a loaf, a slice, or it could be a loaf. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's like that boulder in Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is clearly bread. I do want to tell you that it is, that it is, it is, bread. <laughs> it is bread. And it does say barley bread, by the way, it says, mm -hmm. Seorim, which is not very valued bread. It's, it's kind of the lowest type bread you can get in this barley bread. So yes, and I guess if it's very, very dense, <laughs> I still, still wouldn't knock over a tent, but I've had some dense bread before, but not, not gonna dent, dent, it's not going to do that. Uh, it is interesting, though, that word, the word um, 
It says, Chalom Chalamti, I, I dreamed a dream, which is the way somebody says, I'm, you know, very rarely does it just say I had a dream. So there's a Chalom Chalamti. But the interesting thing is the word Lechem is actually an, uh, it's a, it's a uh, rearrangement of the, uh, you know, an anagram, if you will, of the word halom is lechem. So if you take the chet and put it here, so if you said I had a dream of bread, it's actually a pun or a play on the word halom. So having a dream of lechem, and again, why is, why is Gidon represented by bread? Well, he was hiding bread from the Midianites. So maybe again, this is the, you know, the symbol that he becomes associated with, with Gideon, um, of course, later on, Gideon will be associated with Bibles that are placed in your hotel room without your, you know, without, you know, you can do anything you want with the Bible. You can take it home. It's the Gideons do that. Uh, that's the same Gideon, and they're named after Gideon. At this point, Gideon is still a young man who, or a man who is yet to prove himself in battle. But he's starting to feel a little bit better about himself because he hears that people are, are ascribing to him great military victory. and. Let's see what happens. And it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he bowed himself down to the ground and returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a shofar in each man's hand with empty jars and torches within the jars. Yep. And so doing very quick math, you can see that this is a hundred, there's a hundred people in each company going out in three different companies. Um, it's still not a lot of people. It's, it's not a lot going out against, uh, you know, a multitude of armies. It's literally thousands of people. But what they're going to do here is employ a little bit of uh, trickery. They're going to do a little bit of, they're going to build on the already the feeling of, of whatever he's done so far, Guidon, to start making the people in the uh, Midianite camp afraid. He knows they're already afraid. Mm -hmm. and now he's going to build on that knowledge, right? So he's going to exploit their fear of him with what he does here, with the empty jars and the torches. Again, it's one of the reasons why if you look at the Gideon's Bible, they have a little torch, a little uh, flame on their, on their logo. So a jar actually with a torch coming out of it. So you're gonna see, you probably are kind of figuring out what's gonna happen with these jars and torches, but here's what happens and the shofar. And he said to them, whatever you see me do, do likewise and behold, I am going to the edge of the camp, and it shall be whatever I do, so shall you do. When I blow on the shofar, I and all that are with me, then you blow your shofars also on every side of all the camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came to the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And they had newly posted the sentinels, and they blew with the shofars and broke the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew on their shofars and broke the jars and held the torches in their left hands and the shofars in their right hands to blow on them. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Yep. So they got shofar sounds going and they've got broken jars going and they've got flames going. That's what they're doing, a little psychological warfare. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the camp ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the horns and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow throughout all the camp. And the host fled to Bet Hashita in Zerara and to the border of Al Machalola in Tabat. Yep. And the men of Israel mustered together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after Midian. Okay. Well, wait, before we go there, so um, they caused chaos in the camp. So much so that the people are actually killing each other inside the camp. 
Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible because in warfare and in battle, especially if you have two groups of people that are fighting together, in this case, the Midianites and the Amalekites, who, and again, maybe other peoples that were part of these, part of their outfit, part of their bands, they are not really sure who is who. And they create such chaos and the sounds are all around them that they're not really sure where they're at. So it can create a, a massive crush of people, as we see, unfortunately, even last week in concerts, that people get trampled to death and can get killed um, trying to escape and creating such pa panic and chaos that they end up killing each other. And that's what it says happens. So let's take a quick look at um, what this looks like, because we're going to show what, uh, what this battle looks like at this point which is that you have the Midianites coming out from the, from the east. They come here and they, um, they meet here at this battle of, in the Jezreel Valley. Here you can see where the, the city of Megiddo is and Tanakh. And here's the spring of, of Harod, Ein, Ein Harod, which is the spring, is an Ein or well. And they meet here in the battle right here in this valley. Now, we're going to see it's not just this, this battle, because again, when they come and meet, you know, and they, they meet in this battle, the Midianites, as you can see, are going to be chased. So there's 300 people that are fighting here, or here, I should say. There's 300 people that are fighting here. Um, and then as they escape back out this direction, I'll show you this picture. This is where they fought. This is again, Harod's well. You're gonna see this is the tribes, Asher's Vulun, Naphtali, you have the tribe of Menashe, here's Gilboa. There's Beit Shita, which is also right near where Beth Shan is. And this black line here is the, is the route that the Midianites are going to flee back to, back across the river, the Jordan River is here, back across the river, back to their area here. So you can see, here's the first tribes in the north, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and Manasseh, all attacking here. Again, Manasseh is, is, is the tribe that Gideon, Gideon is part of. Um, but you're going to see as they keep going across, the people that are going to attack them as they are, as they're coming out. So again, only 300 people were fighting here, but thousands of them are attacking them on their way out. So it's not simply, well, 300 people, you know, beat this huge army. It's that they were already retreating. And then as they're retreating, these other tribes are going to come out and attack them. So this is the first part. They come out and they attack them there. And then it says. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying, come down against Midian and seize before them the waters as far as bet Barah and the Jordan. Then all of the men of Ephraim were mustered and they took the waters as far as bet Barah and the Jordan. And they took two princes of Midian, Orev and Ze'ev, and they slew Orev on the rock. Orev and Ze'ev, they slew at the winepress of Ze'ev and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Orev and Ze'ev to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. Yeah, so it seems like Manasseh, and their fellow tribes, people from Joseph, the Ephraimites work together here too. And so the Ephraimites come out and do some of the work, which is why we saw that side where the Ephraimites come out and hit them as they're coming back down. Um, but it's not so simple. And the men of Ephraim said to him, what have you done to us? that you did not call us when you went to fight with Midian. And they quarreled with him sharply. And he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Are not the gleanings of Ephraim better than the vintage of Aviezer? 
Yeah, so there seems to be, seems to be a little problem that the Ephraimites go, yeah, but why didn't you call us before? You know, why, why are you calling us to clean up on the exit, you know, on, on their leaving when all the stuff that they left behind up there, we don't get any part of that, right? We don't get any of those spoils of battle, yet you call us now to, to finish up here? And essentially, his take on it is, well, first of all, you're, you're, it's not, you know, this wasn't in your own backyard. This was in our backyard anyways. And you're still, I still called you. He's like, you, this isn't enough for you? I called you. So, yeah, it seems like Ephraim and Manasseh should get along, but they don't. And, and this is a part of the problem that we see with this tribal confederation, is that the tribes themselves are not always getting along. Now, this is the first time that it's become so apparent, okay? But I will promise you that as we go through the book of Judges, it's going to get worse. But you're starting to see here what really is happening, which is that, yes, the Midianites and the Canaanites and everyone else is beating us up. But we're not getting along, and that's what's also precipitating this, this disaster, which is we can't get our act together. We can't unify because we have people doing this, which is, what do you mean you didn't call me before? What are you doing? It's going to get worse in the book of Judges. God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, or Rev and Zeev, and what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. And Gideon came to the Jordan and passed over. He and the 300 men that were with him faint, yet pursuing them. Yeah, so crisis is averted at this point, but you're getting a taste, a little foreshadowing of if somebody's not as good as Gideon at calming people down. There is a recipe for fratricide, for intertribal murder, if you will. And he said to the men of Sukkot, give, I pray you, loaves of bread to the people that follow me, for they are faint. And I am pursuing after Zebah and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the princes of Sukkot said, are the hands of Zavah and Zalmunna now in the, your hand that we should give bread to your army? And Gideon said, therefore, when the Lord has delivered Zavah and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. That is not a good thing. That is a very strong warning that if you don't take care of us, I will come back and you will be punished. Um, not good. This is, this is uh, a warning. And he went up from there to Penuel and spoke to them likewise. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkot had answered him. And he spoke also to the men of Penuel, saying, when I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Yeah, so Penuel, this, this city, seems to have had a, um, a tower. In addition to having a, you know, city walls, it actually has a tower, which is it's pretty good. I mean, that's not, that's not normal in those days, that they actually get to... Uh, you know, they actually get to um, build something that big. So this is a, you know, this is all on the other side of the Jordan River. This is east of the Jordan River, okay? So the, the people in these towns refuse to take care of, of uh, Gideon and his army. This is um, not a tribe acting this way, but it is a city. This is a city acting this way. So, um, again, they didn't think they had to. They didn't think they were, they, didn't, they weren't afraid of Gideon. So, didn't, 
I mean, it seems to me like it would make sense to give the guy some bread, but they're not afraid of him. Well, let's read what happens. Now Zephah and Zalmunna were in Karkor and their hosts with them, about 15,000 men. All that were left of all the camp of the children of the east, for there fell 120,000 men that drew sword. And Gideon went up by the way of the tent dwellers on the east of Novah and Yogbeha and smote the camp, for the camp thought itself secure. Yeah, so I want to make it clear. According to this now, we actually have a total, whether it's the accurate total, an assumed total, a mystical, symbolic total. There was, according to this, 120,000 Midianites and Amalekites that came against Israel, that 300 people met in battle, but chased out. They didn't kill all of them then, but some of them were killed then. And then as they were escaping, more and more tribes came out and attacked them. So it wasn't like 300 people killed most of 120,000 people. But by the time they get to Karkor, which is, again is in the Jordan, in modern day Jordan, Karkar, it's still one place. I mean, it's a, we know where Karkor is. That by that point, by that point, there's only like 10% of the people or like 90% of the army's already been wiped out. 85% or whatever of the army has been wiped out. It's, it's, it's a complete route. And again, it wasn't that 300 people killed all of them. The other tribes came out and attacked them. The Ephraimites and Asher and I thought we read about all those other tribes that came out, but it's still 300 people that met 120,000 people in an in initial battle. That is pretty wild. It is a scary, scary, scary um, route, which again is why we still talk about it. It's one of the reasons why in the Bible and the book of Judges, it stands out as a tremendous victory for the Israelite tribes people. So uh 100 there's it says 15,000 people left yep and when zava and zalmunna fled he pursued after them and took the two kings of midian zava and zalmunna and the whole camp was panic stricken and gideon the son of yoash returned from the battle from the ascent of Jerez, and caught a young man of this of sukkot and inquired of him and he wrote down for him the princes of Sukkot and its elders, 77 men. Yep. And this is, as you can see, payback time. And again, this is not what should have happened. That Just by virtue of the laws of hospitality, you take care of people when they're in need of food. I mean, even if it's 300 people, you still take care of these people, right? And so they find this guy from, they, they, they see a, a guy from Sukkot. They, I don't know if they inquired of him, interrogated him. Inquired of him might be a little bit of a, of a euphemism for what they did to him, but they want to know who was in charge of Sukkot. And he came to the men of Sukkot and said, Behold, Zava and Zalmunna, with whom you taunted me, saying, Are the hands of Zava and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your men that are weary? And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he chastised the men of Sukkot. And he beat down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. Then said he to Zava and Zalmunna, where are the men whom you slew at Tabor? And they answered, as you are, so they were the same in shape, like the sons of a king. So um, so he goes to battle or whatever. He does his vengeance against Sukkot and Penuel, which are, which are Israelite towns. I mean, these are towns that, that, you know, didn't do the right thing in the first place. And he's kind of sending a message to them. And then uh, now that he has got these two guys, these two Midianite kings, he's kind of reminding him of what they did to the people of Israel before. So Tabor, right, is Mount Tabor is right where Deborah was. So he's saying, what, 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 what was, what was it like those guys that you, um, you killed, our our people that you killed? I mean, you, you can see what's happening here. I mean, this is the ultimate you know, 
scene in a in a climax in the movie where the 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 banditos are finally getting their comeuppance like the, there's no one around them anymore their army their 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 group has now been routed and they're dead it's just the last couple of guys left for the final showdown and he says some more you know what about those guys what about our guys that you killed was, they were just like you right and he says to them and he said they were my brothers the sons of my mother as the lord lives if you had saved them alive i would not slay you and he said to yeter his firstborn up and slay them but the youth did not draw his sword for he feared because he was still a lad so yeah you just read this story which again we didn't have this part of the story before which were that his own family members were killed you know, in battle against the Midianites already, right? So he says, these are the sons of my mother, which again, seems to imply even a closer relationship, not just brothers, but actually we have the same mom. So we're not half brothers, we're full brothers and you killed them. And if you hadn't killed them, I wouldn't kill you. But of course the, you don't have to say, he doesn't have to say, but I'm going to kill you. And it's it's a really powerful scene. And it gets enhanced by the fact that he's not going to kill him. He's going to have his son come up and kill him. But his son, his firstborn son, he says to him, he says to him, get up, kum, get up and kill him. Kill them. Kill the two guys, the kings. But the guy didn't want it. The kid didn't want to do it. He was too young, it says. He was did not want to kill anybody. That's a pretty, pretty, it's a pretty far out scene. I mean, it is a, it is a literally like memorable. You can't forget this scene. Literally, I mean, Guidon telling his son, you kill the guy. Then Zeba and Salmuna said, rise you and fall upon us for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zavah and Talmuna and took away the crescents that were on their camel's necks. Mm -hmm. So they say to him, you kill us. And he basically, they're basically saying to Gideon, if you kill us, you know, then we're not going to be remembered as being killed by a kid. You know, he, they're actually asking for help here. They're actually asking for him to honor them by killing them, killing us yourself. It's a wild scene. I mean, really, really, really powerful scene. Don't let your kid kill. Don't let one of your kids, don't let a kid kill me. You kill us. I mean, you're literally begging for death by the hands of a guy. Now, this would be, again, considered to be a mark of honor, the fact that they, that they wanted to be killed by a man and not by a child. So what does he do? He kills him. He does get up. He says the same word, kum, get up. And he killed him. And he took their crescents that were on the camel's necks. Now, what this clearly indicates is that the Midianite kings, the kings, uh, the, the rulers, of the, the heads of the Midianite tribes, they had crescents on their camels. Again, probably made out of gold some kind of crescent that again in islam the crescent is still one of the symbols the crescent moon is still one of the symbols in that culture and it seems like again even in the ancient world this symbol was a symbol for for the midianites for these bedouin people and so he takes them he takes it away again this is a, one of his ways of asserting his dominance and this is what they say then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule you over us, both you and your son and your son's son also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So he says, no, I won't be your king. You have a king. It's God. My kids won't rule over you. I'm not going to rule. No one's ruling over you. 
the people tried to make Gideon the king. He says, no. Very reminiscent of George Washington, too. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be king. You just fought You just fought to get rid of a king. Now you want me to be king? No, we're not going to have a king. But this is even deeper because he says, God is the king. And so he won't do it. And he says, I'm not going to be king, and my son's not going to be a king. I will tell you, as we're going to read next week, not so simple. Guy can this guy Gidon is clearly a hero. He's clearly a um, an amazing guy because he doesn't want his own ego to be fed. He doesn't want to be getting powerful, and he he doesn't want to, he doesn't want anything for himself from this. His son, on the other hand, we'll see next week. We'll finish up this story today. And Gideon said to them, I would make a request of you that you would give me every man the earrings of his spoil, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Is that right, Ishmaelites? Yep, they were Ishmaelim. They were Ishmaelites. So it says right here that the Midianites, or at least the Amalekites, or at least this group, even though we know the Midianites are the sons or descendants of Abraham, at least this author seems to say that these are Arabs, these are Ishmaelites who have this stuff. They have these golden earrings that they have, which again was something that this distinguished the, the Arabs, the Ishmaelites in those days. And so he says, just give me the earrings. Give me the earrings from what we took. That's all I want. It's not a lot, right? You don't think it's a lot. Well, it'll add up. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and cast on it every man the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Besides the crescents and the eardrops and the purple garments that were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were about their camels' necks. Wow. So, again, we, we heard already he took the crescents, and he took, according to, according to this, he also took the other stuff that was kind of attached to that, if you will, the special stuff that the, that the uh, camels had. That's how, that's how they decked out their camels. Like people decked out their horses. They decked out their camels. That was their, that was their, that was their animal that they used to go into warfare. So they decked them out. Nice. So he gets that and it adds up. There's so many people that get, that they killed was that he winds up with 1,700 shekels. I mean, that's a huge weight of gold, but it adds up when you kill that many people, when you kill 120,000 people. Take a, he asked for the littlest thing. He asked for the little tiny, little tiny earring, but it added up when there's so many people that he killed. He didn't say, I want all their treasures. I don't want all their coins. I don't want any coins that these people have. I don't want any of their, their swords. I don't want any of their jewelry that they had, their, their bangles or their, or their necklaces or any of the other jewelry that they had, any necklace they had. All I want is their tiniest piece that they have, their earring. I'll take that. There's so many of them that he winds up with this kind of stuff. And what does he do with it, though? And Gideon made an effort of this and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went astray there after it, which thing became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness for 40 years in the days of Gideon. And Jerubal, the son of Yoash, went and dwelt in his own house. And Gideon had 70 sons begotten of his body, for he had many wives. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bore him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. That is where we're going to lay off today. We're going to lay off with his son, Abimelech. So what we know about Jerubal slash Gidon is that he has... Uh, a lot of wives and he has a lot of money and leads him to have a lot of kids and one of his kids we're going to hear about is Avi Melech we're going to read about next week look the guy has many good qualities about himself he's a great hero he's someone who leads the people in battle he's gives them confidence and he brings peace to the land the land was quiet Tishkot Haaretz again quiet for 40 years just like after Deborah but one of the things that he did is he created an ephod 
this gold piece, like the FO that was on the priest, the high priest, this thing that we're not really sure what it looked like. We're not 100% sure what an FO looks like, which is why we usually translate it as an FO. But it's some type of gold charm, gold, a gold piece, if you will. And what happens to that is that it becomes an idol. It may be intended to be that, but it does. And the thing became a snare to Gidon and to his house. So may not have intended it to be that, but it becomes an idol. And this is something that he ends up bringing down his own destruction or his own, uh, that creates the problem. Because even though he's got a lot of good qualities, either intentionally or unintentionally, it seems like it was unintentional, but I guess you could say that, you know, he had this little piece of himself that he needed to, if he didn't need to have the gold in the first place, he wouldn't have done it. Also wouldn't have led to him having all these kids. And this situation of having all these kids also becomes a very big tragedy. So what we're going to read next week is the story of Avimelech. And we're going to see, we're almost done with chapter eight, but we're going to read about Avimelech and what happens to the sons. Mark, uh, yes. where, where is the tent at this point and the ark? I don't remember. So uh, right now, it's right over here. It's not, it's not right there, but it's in the, it's in, uh, it's in this area around, around uh, Shiloh. And um, it is, uh, it is not far. If we look, oh, I wanted to show everybody a quick map today. Uh, we'll finish with this. This is the map of the north part of Israel. So uh, this is Israel today. Here's Ein Harod, which is where the battle was fought. You can see there's Ein Harod Union and Ein Harod United. That goes back to the establishment of the kibbutz that was there back in the 20s. And then later on, kind of split into two. Uh, uh, there was like a really, really communist part of Ein Harod and then like a more socialist. They were all communists, but they were or socialists, but there were some more dedicated communists. So Ein Harod was this uh, kibbutz there, right in that area. You can see Merhavia is over here. Um, Beit Alpha is one of the great uh, archaeological sites. And here's Beit Shan, which is obviously a great archaeological site. It's a Roman city here. There's also a city. You can see it's a, it's a, today it's a, it's a development city. This is the, this is the Jordan River right here, folks. This is the Jordan. And this is the, this is the boundary with the, with Jordan. I mean, this is the boundary. So when we, when we drive up, um, when we drive up the Jordan Valley from Jerusalem, we come up and we, we, we go up from Jerusalem down here, we come down Jerusalem, we go up the, the Jordan Valley Road, and there's the Jordan, like that, there's the, the, the boundary between Israel and Jordan is the Jordan River. As we go up on this Israel side, we're going up from here, we're in the West Bank, all the way from here, this is all West Bank, all the way up to here, right when we get to here, we're now, this is Israel again. And this is Beit Shan. This is Beit Shan, which is the Roman city of Beit Shan. And this is the road out to Ein Harod. And if you go out here, this is Afula. Uh, this is actually Merhavia. This is Afula up here. Um, and then if you stay on this on this road up here, you go through, go through, you go up to Haifa. So this valley right here, this Jezreel Valley, as we talked about. A very fertile place. It's where a lot of the kibbutzim were. This is where a lot of farms are. Um, and it's beautiful, a beautiful part of the, this is hilly a little bit over here. And then this valley here is where a lot of the kibbutz are. This is where Tavor is. This is where Tavor, where we were talking about with, um, with uh, where he's talked about his brothers being killed at Tavor. This is also where, uh, <coughs> the area where, um, where Deborah was in the north, and we're again we're not talking about very far. I mean, this is this is five miles from from Tavor to Ein Harod is five miles. It's another four or five miles to Beit Shan. It's not, I mean we're talking about walkable distances. This is, these are you know you'd walk that in a few hours, right? So uh, this is the border though with the West Bank. So this area down here, this is all Palestinian, which is why you see all the places Jenin, Kabatia. These are all. These are all Arab towns. This actually, Umal Fam is a, a Arab 
Israeli Arab town. So it's technically in Israel, but it's all it's all Arab. There, there have been talks about making this area Palestinian territory if Israel ever separates from the Palestinians, that this area actually will be given to the Palestinians because it's all Palestinian anyway. So it's actually a part of Israel that could essentially go back and not be, um, but I'm not saying that'll happen. It's been talked about. Um, and again, when we talk about where he goes to live, where um, where he just, we just read that he goes back to live is that he lives down here in um, Nablus, which is Shechem. So when it says that he returns to Shechem, that's where he lives, which is right in Ephraim, Menashe area. This area in the biblical period was Ephraim and Menashe. This was Menashe. So um, it's not that far. I mean, now you're talking, we went out a little bit more. So this is like 30 miles from Tiberias down to Nablus. But uh, this is also hillier here. This area here in the West Bank is the hilly part. And this is the valley part. So you can't really see it too much. Let me let me actually show you what it looks like on a, maybe this, I don't know if the new maps have the topography um, quite like that, but you can see if I can get this real quick, that this area here, this is all hilly. This is the, these are the mountains of Ephraim. These were the hill, this was the hill country for us, which is now the hill country for the Palestinians. And down here below this valley, you can see it. This is the hills and this is the valley. You can see where there's farms, like up here. I keep doing that. Whenever I zoom in on it, it goes away. But you can see that um, up here, there aren't a lot of farms because these are hills and you can see this is all mountainy. And there's, you know, occasionally there's some green areas, but this is where all the kibbutzim are. This is where the, this is the border. And so this area here was where all the kibbutzim were. And this is all, all these areas you see here are farms, right? These are all the farms of Israel and the Jezreel, we call the Jezreel Valley. And it goes all the way up here. Here's Nazareth, which by the way, you know, Nazareth, we know about it from Christian history from, um, Jesus, but this is also a, a part Palestinian, Arab, whatever you want to call it, Muslim, Arab town, and also Jewish. So this is this is the Jewish side up here, and this is the Arab side down there. That's not going to become part of the Arab country, because even though it's predominantly Arab, it's very much, it's not close to the border. I mean, the, it's not far, but it's not on the, it's not adjacent to the border. This is the border. That's That's Palestinian territory here. It's not, Nazareth is not going to become that part. But again, as you go along this valley, this is where the hill of Carmel is, right? So this is all Carmel Mountain, and that's Haifa here, at the bottom of Mount Carmel. So here it gets hilly again. So this is all valley, and then it's hilly here. So that's, it gives you an idea of what Israel looks like today. And so this area right here is where all of the really big kibbutz were during the 1920s and 1930s were established in this area. There's not a lot to see in this area. Like we don't usually do a lot of touring around this area because it's a lot of farms. And it's not very big, but it's still, there's not a whole lot of things to see, except here is Megiddo. We take people sometimes to Megiddo, uh, not lately because people were kind of bored with Megiddo, but um, but yeah, all these other, these are all uh, kibbutzim. And then you have a couple of places around here, which there is good sightseeing, which you can go to like Nazareth has some sites, seems obviously for uh, Christians, but if you go to Tsipori, which is one of the places we go to now all the time, you can see some beautiful, beautiful uh, mosaics and some of the, the synagogue in Tsipori, which you can see is right out, right outside of Nazareth. So hopefully we'll be there soon. We'll be returning to Israel next year with one of our trips. So there's Nazareth and then there's Tsipori. And there's a couple of Jewish sites here to see, you know, like a, uh, from the Talmudic period, because this area was very important during the Talmudic area. This was definitely Jews were living up here 2,000 years ago. All right, everybody, it's good having you with us, and stay good. Hope to see you tomorrow night for Genesis, or again, Friday night for services with Rick and Addie will be at our shul, and you can watch it online, though. If you're not going to be able to be there, we'll be streaming that live. So take care, everybody. Good to see you all.